Hello and welcome to Experimentation Masters, the leading resource for business experimentation. Join fellow innovators, strategists and entrepreneurs to learn practical tips, methods and techniques from world-leading experts in experimentation. Design better experiments, lead with more confidence and have greater impact in your organization. Now please welcome your host, Gavin Bryant. Hello and welcome to the Experimentation Masters podcast. Today, I would like to welcome Johnny Longdon to the show. Johnny is Conversion Director at Journey Further, performance marketing agency that works with some of the world's leading brands. In this episode, we're going to discuss how Johnny implemented and scaled experimentation at Sky. Welcome to the show, Johnny. Uh, thank you very much. Hello. Thank you for having me on. Okay, let's get started. Uh, Johnny, you've been working around experimentation for over a decade now. How did you uh-huh. get started? Uh, yeah, so so before I got into experimentation, I was in um, what today people call data science, but it was just called analytics then, really. So um, I wasn't, I was never really a data scientist. I was kind of a consultant. So um, I was working with. CRM database marketing and things like that, and basically uh, helping companies build propensity modeling and segmentation and stuff like that. Um, and uh, and then I I kind of had a sense that um, that digital was the way things were going to go, which obviously it was. And, and I sort of wanted to transition into that world, so I got a, a job with an agency, with a digital agency that was kind of a web dev design all round agency. Um, initially as in a sort of a data planning kind of role. Um, and that, and then that I very quickly sort of morphed that myself into more of an experimentation role purely because around at that time, this is about 14 years ago. And around that time, that's when Google website optimizer first launched. And, and that sort of coincided with me starting in this role. Um, and because of my background, because, you know, a, a lot of what I'd done before that as well was things like, um, experimentation in direct marketing campaigns and things like that. So it was instantly just a way to kind of uh, bridge the two worlds um, and to bring the sort of learning that I had from my, my previous career into a digital environment. So I was sort of instantly hooked and, um, and yeah, and started uh, really sort of pursuing ways to do that and do more of that. I've always had a kind of an analytics edge to my career as well. So I've always, I've always done digital analytics as, alongside that as well as, as well as strategy and all that sort of stuff as well. So yeah, that's, that's how it came about. Okay. So off a really strong foundation in analytics and data, which is, uh, you know, effectively the, the cornerstone of good experimentation practice. Yeah, exactly. I think the other thing as well is that at the time I, I noticed that there were quite a lot of people sort of nascently doing digital analytics and things like that who who didn't actually have any experience in analytics. So you need to have like agencies and people and companies that had people in them doing using Google Analytics and you know the, the sort of proto versions of that around the time. And they would generally come from a sort of a planning background or they'd be account managers or something like that. And so I kind of saw that there was a bit of a gap in the market where, you know, it's like if you get if you if you get some some actual experience of analytics and couple that with digital analytics, there was a bit, you know, that's a, a fairly rare thing at the time, which it was. It still is in a way, really, um, because I think one of the issues is that Google Analytics and tools like that, they sort of do the analytics for you in a way, because it's, you know, it just presents you with all these reports. But actually the critical thinking that goes with analytics um, is something that is very important and is something that is trained through sort of doing proper analytics. So, and there is still a bit of a gap there where you, you know, what people call analytics is not what analytics really is. So thinking about your guiding principles or your experimentation thesis, how would you describe that? Yeah, um, I think, you know, I, I very often say to people that after 14 years of running tests on websites, it would be really easy for me to go around saying, I know what you should do to your website. I've got this list of best practices. I'm an expert in all this. And um, it's simply not true. I have no idea um, because really the, the reality, the only true thing that you, can, that you can say after 14 years of running tests is that you just have to test everything 
because you can't really um, second guess what's going to work on websites. You can to an extent, but not in the grand scheme of things. Um, and, you know, it, no, no matter how much of a no-brainer something seems, no matter how obvious it seems to you, there, there's a very good chance it's not going to work. And, um, you know, so you have to be humble. You have to realize that our opinions and our, our rational ways of thinking about what you should do to your site or your business or whatever are completely inherently flawed. And the only way to uh, really learn is to test pretty much everything. Um, so that is really the, the, the sort of starting point that I have behind it. And, you know, and, and any company that, is, that we're working with or ask for advice, that is what I would say to them. That, you know, if you're not testing, there's a really, really good chance that 90% of what you're doing is a complete and utter waste of time and money. Mm. Um, or worse, is actually having a detrimental impact on your, on your business. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's, and, and, I guess, and I guess really like stepping outside of that on a wider level, um, you know, what, what, what we do is, has become complicated around like the terminology that people use and the way it's described and the way it's perceived and things like that. You know, it gets seen as a channel alongside PPC and things like that. And at the end of the day, when you just forget about all that, what we're actually talking about, what we're doing is putting the scientific method at the heart of how you make decisions around your business. You know, it's just about using research and data to come up with hypotheses and finding ways to validate those hypotheses in real situations with real customers so that you can understand how things really work instead of how you think they work. And that, at the end of the day, is what you're trying to do. And you think, why, why, would, you, why would you not do that? You know, um, you know, all of the great things in the world have been brought about through the uh, careful application of a scientific method, you know, space flight, medicine, everything. So, you know, apply that to your business. Why wouldn't you do that? And, and that, you know, if you try and, try and get people to understand that, that that's broadly what it is and, and, and to see beyond all of the sort of misperceptions and strangeness that, that comes with it when you, you know, when you think you know what it is. From your experience, why do you think there's some reticence to more readily apply the scientific method to problem solving in business? Yeah, it's a really interesting area, um, uh, and I think I think personally, a lot of it comes down to the nature of corporate hierarchy and the way people are kind of hired and valued and, monet and you know and monetized. Um, because um, <clears throat> you know, if you think about it, like people, when people hire people into businesses, they're really buying their past experience. Like you get them, you get paid more for having more relevant and, um, and you know, literally more, you know, in time, um, background experience. So, you know, someone who can come into a business and go, I've worked here and I've done this and I've got 10 years experience <clears throat> gets paid more for that. And that's how, that's how we work in the business world. That's how the business world sort of, that's the commodity of people in the business world. And so when somebody gets into a company, they have to justify the, what they're being paid and, and what they're being paid is related to their past experience and their brain and their things that they've done and how they do things. And so they have to justify their value using their opinion um, and, and, and their, um, you know, their past experience and the knowledge that they have um, rather than their ability to you know, exercise a process. So it really comes down to that. And that is why you have a lot of ego in business. You know, people start in new companies and they go, well, you know, I worked here and this is how we did it here. And this is, and it worked there. And, you know, everybody wants to sort of, um, you know, bring their own opinion and their own ego and mind to the table. And that's fundamentally what, what basically underpins business culture. And that is why experimentation is so challenging a lot of the time. And it's so challenging to get people to think like that because, even though they might rationally, consciously think, yeah, you know, we should do this testing, at the end of the day, subconsciously and emotionally, they're, they're living according to that because that is how, that's how the business world works and they, they can't really not do that. So, yeah, that's, that's really it. And, I mean, you know, that's, that's huge, right? It's, you know, how do you change that? But, you know, we chip away. Um, yeah, I think that's a really good point. And... It's almost the notion of I don't know 
is lost in business. And I don't know is something that even as children in in early preschool and in high school is uh, viewed as negative. But we we should be starting from a position of I don't know and asking questions and forming hypotheses as uh, as a foundational element rather than uh, calling the shots. So it's a much better position to come from, and then we build up our reasoning and our understanding sequentially like climbing a ladder exactly yeah it's, and it's the same with failure you know um you know th- there there are companies where that are built on a culture of the fear of failure you know people think if they they are owning and responsible for initiative that fails that they will get fired that um or they at least won't get promoted or something like that so um you know uh that causes people to either avoid doing things that they think might fail or to uh, spin things that they have done into things that are successful. And that's very, very common. You know, you get, you get businesses that have never, ever failed at anything. Like obviously they have, but they very carefully cover it up. So, you know, yeah, uh, you know, I mean, I've been in roles in my life where my job was effectively to spin numbers, um, to make things look like they were successful when they weren't. Um, so, you know, that happens all the time. So yeah, it's just, it's about, um, you know, trying to kind of install that sort of growth mindset, which is, which is what you do with children. You know, you want, you want children to realize that trying something and failing is literally how you learn. Like if you, if you, um, if you can't get on a bike because you're terrified of falling off, you'll never learn to ride a bike, like falling off and then working out how not to fall off is how you learn to ride a bike and it's and it's exactly the same in anything um but it's it's amazing that you know companies a lot of businesses don't work like that at all so um you know in a lot of in a lot of the way in a lot of ways a business can be more juvenile than a child (laughs) Mm. so yeah i get asked that question a lot and you probably do too in your role um you know people want to know how can they position and talk about failure more readily and I think a way to reframe that is always around learning. If you're framing failure as failure, no executive or senior leader, as you pointed out, wants to be associated with failure. And mm. uh, as much as failure is beneficial and it can uh, you know, stop an initiative early in the piece and uh, be a positive in some respects that there's this stigma around failure in business and really it's like a bad smell. No one wants to be attached to it. Exactly. Yeah. And like there's, there's quite a few things around terminology and the language that we use like that. Um, you know, uh, you know, I've had, had this conversation quite a lot recently, but it's quite common in, in experimentation and, you know, CRO, we'll get back to that in a minute, but, um, the, you know, people talk about winning and losing, um, in experiments and, uh, and, you know, that in itself is very, 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 charged language like you know like you know who wants to lose you know like <laughs> it's you know it's, it's like sports language isn't it it's like you know why would you want to lose when you can win um but you know if if you if you went and asked a scientist who was kind of trying to develop cancer cures or something what the outcome of an experiment was there's no way they would say it won would they it's like you know it just doesn't make any sense it's, it's a nonsense you can't win or lose in experimentation. You, you're finding something out. That's the point. Um, so, yeah, all that kind of language of winning and losing and failing and succeeding and things like that doesn't do anybody any favors. And um, it's hard to kind of get out, out of the, the other one, which is, sort of, you know, slightly unrelated. But, you know, I said CRO and I said experimentation in the same sentence. And, um you know, that's a weird thing that like a lot of people call it conversion optimization. And yeah, it, it just, you know, it has that name. So you can't really get out of it. And yeah, it's a really sort of weird name. And, and a lot of people go, oh, you know, don't be so pernickety about like, you know, the language. It's just a name. doesn't matter. It kind of does for the same reason, you know, like the, the exact same reason that, you know, people going around talking about failure and losing um, is, is has a really big impact on, on their re- where their likelihood to take seriously what it is we're trying to show them and conversion optimization, it, it ha- you know, the words 
have so much meaning in them that you know that 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 um sort of railroads what you're trying to do really like um for a start optimization you know imply it really implies tweaking something that's already been done you know it's like you know we're gonna we're gonna build this stuff we're gonna pull this work in and then we'll optimize it so you have people going, oh, well, there's no point optimizing this because we, we're going to rebuild it. You know, and there's no point optimizing this website because we're going to rebuild it. It's like there's every point in optimizing, you know, in, in doing experimentation if you're going to rebuild it. But they can't see beyond that because, because the words give them this, this view of what it is. Um, so, yeah, like, yeah, there's no, there's no kind of answer to this question, but the, but the language is, is kind of quite important, really. Mm. Let's jump forward to Sky. Yeah. So thinking about those early days at Sky, what was the experimentation culture like before implementation and scaling of the program? Yeah, so a bit, bit of context first is um, just before I joined Sky, Sky had um, uh, a very fragmented engineering setup where different divisions and even departments within those divisions had their own completely separate product teams um and and developers and they were completely siloed within vertical business units so you know sky sports and the publishing size sky sports and sky news might have had separate ones you know there would have been one in the sales area one customer service area and actually like um what what happened prior to me joining was a big sort of company-wide initiative was um, a, a move to um, con- consolidate all of that into a single um, sort of central um, center of excellence for digital. So actually like, and the, the location moved uh, drastically as well. So, so uh, actually what happened was that we, we built a, a whole new office in Leeds um, that today I believe is somewhere around 600 software developers, um, and that is a cent. It's almost like a central agency, internal agency, as it were, um, for any engineering and dev stuff that happens. Um, and I was hired right at the very, very inception of that, like just before we started building the office. Um, and my role was initially incredibly ambiguous. Like I was very sort of, I was hired on. The basis of just we're, we're hiring all these developers. We're putting a load of investment into development of our um, different products and you know uh, digital stuff. How do we make sure it's commercially viable? Um, and that was really like the job description. It was a question rather than you know any any kind of solution. Uh, and it was it was basically because of my background that my answer to that question was. Um, experimentation and so i i very quickly sort of morphed my own role into being you know almost solely about experimentation in that product environment um <clears throat> prior to that um there, there had there had been some experimentation going on in in some individual areas um but it was incredibly um sort of varied in terms of what people were doing in different areas there was some some um, reasonably advanced stuff going on in the sales area. Um, although interestingly, um, that area sort of works to, to kind of daily um, trading targets. And so they were trying to do this very, very fast, you know, testing, like almost daily testing, um, which, you, which you can imagine is not a good thing to do. So, um, yeah, there wasn't, there was no cohesive sort of, um, plan for it really um and certainly no culture of it so um sky sky is is um uh is is um is not too much of a what i was talking about in terms of um you know having a real aversion to failure and things like that um it's it's not it's not um you know google or amazon in that respect either but it's not it's not the worst kind of place you could work like that um so there was some there was some receptiveness i think in the culture to to doing that right from the outset 
Okay. So yeah, there was a, a culture of experimentation. It was fragmented. There was no standardization of processes and procedures and communication and uh, quite different levels of maturation depending on the, the internal department. So based on that landscape that you, you faced into, what happened next? Yeah, so the the uh, I mean, I I, I quickly uh, managed to secure uh, funding for resource so for people. Um, I was able. I mean, the 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 really beauty of it was that we were building this whole kind of environment from scratch, and um, there was no processes, no nothing. We invented it all from scratch, and I was kind of like fairly closely involved in how the agile ways of working and things like that were being designed. So it was a really beneficial place to be in terms of, you know, being able to kind of take a step back and go, this is the way that experimentation should work in these environments. Um, because otherwise, you you know, you're, you're really sort of dealing with a lot of legacy things that already exist and trying to kind of work around them. Well, we didn't have that. We, um, you know, we were building everything new and I was working side by side with the, um, the you know the senior people developing the engineering practices and things like that. So, so it was really a really interesting time, and you know managed to develop what I still think are pretty pioneering ways of experimentation integrating with product development. Um, there were some interesting kind of hurdles that happened though, which um, which you know are, are just good sort of stories, I guess, for people to hear about. But. Um, the the first thing really that happened was I managed to hire I managed to hire a, a a really good team of of people you know skilled and capable of running experimentation, and what we did was we aligned them to different squads within the business. So you know there, there's squads that would look after Sky Sports, Sky News, sales, service, product, that you know all that sort of stuff, and, and we aligned these um, resources with these areas so that they were effectively part of the scrum team you know not not from a direct reporting point of view but but from a from a cultural point of view they were sort of sitting with the scrum teams in these areas and working closely with the product owners and all that sort of stuff so and that and that you know worked really well like the, the theory behind that was that product teams don't really want you know somebody over there throwing things over the wall at them you know they want you know it works better if everybody's kind of working together and involved and discussing things together and that worked that worked really well to a point um the interesting thing that happened was that what we learned eventually was that um you know we 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 were we were coming up with um things that were successful outcomes of experiments that we were then we would then say this needs to be pushed into production. It needs to be released on the production side. And those things would just end up sitting in a backlog and never actually getting done. Um, and so that was the first kind of hurdle where, we, you know, kind of realized why is that happening? And and the answer to it became really interesting because what I learned was that um, there is two things really. One is that, you know, if 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 a squad has a single roadmap, um, then that tends to get prioritized in, in different ways. And, um, you know, what you end up having is there are critical bugs um, that everyone goes, yeah, we can't possibly have that. It's brand damage that just sort of gets solved. And plus developers love solving bugs. You know, it's, it's almost like a little competition to see who can, who can solve the bug fastest. So those things all kind of get done. And like any new bug that's found, it kind of gets done. And then at the opposite end of the scale, you've got bigger in sort of bigger projects that tend to come from the business side of new functionality that's required, new products that are being developed and things like that. And because of the external demand for those things from other areas of the business, um, you know, that it, it, there's a reactive nature to the prioritization of that, that, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of who shouts the loudest. And plus, those projects tend to be more interesting for developers to work on. And that's kind of a really key thing is de developers, you know, their, their careers are based on, um, you know, how much they get exposure to new technologies and new code bases and things like that. So, so they will gravitate towards the more complex and interesting projects. And by nature, what comes out of experimentation tends to be more, uh, more simple to do. 
So that's why you end up with this situation where, you know, that kind of stuff will often never get done. And the, and the answer we came up with was, one, we split that roadmap into several different roadmaps, up to three different roadmaps, um, in order that, you know, each one could be tracked differently. Um, and um, if, you know, if resource was tight, each one could be squeezed, but not, you know, not um, killed completely. And the other thing that happened was that the, the developers were rotated around those. So, and, you know, that's a really important thing that people probably don't often think about is like, you know, developers don't really like working on basic projects. Um, and so if, if that was all they were doing, it might be felt relatively unfulfilling. Um, and so to rotate them around. But the, the other one was to, to have a specific roadmap that was around developers uh, supporting the experimentation project. So, um, yeah, that, that, that all kind of um, hadn't 100% come to fruition by the time I left. So I don't really know where it went, but that, that was the, the theory of it, at least. So once uh, the team started running experiments and effectively interrogating the roadmaps, which the roadmaps are effectively uh, hypotheses about what may work in the future, how, how did the business take on the data from experiments and change the approach if it was warranted by way of, of road mapping? Um, yeah, so I guess it sort of depends on the area, I guess. Um, and you know, and, we, and we, I guess we sort of developed little different microcultures in different sort of areas of the business. But um, I think really one of the, just to slightly change the question, but I think one of the, one of the most important things that we were able to do in terms of developing the culture was trying to surface and socialize sort of bigger and more high profile tests and their outcomes. Um, so as you can imagine, Sky is an enormous company and a, and a, and a complex matrix environment. And, uh, you know, and, and it's, it's very political as well as businesses like that often are. And, um, so you know, you, you've one of my roles really ended up being sort of almost constant stakeholder management and socialising what we're doing and you know that kind of stuff. And that's a, a constantly changing playing field because you know restructures happen and things like this. So you know, it's, it's constantly changing and constantly having to do it. But what 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 always kind of got traction with things was about demonstrating, you know, here's something that um, everybody thought was going to work and, you know, we invested in and it didn't. Or here's something that, um, you know, that that seems like a great idea and actually it didn't do anything, you know. And so, you know, and obviously the, there's a commercial implication to those, which is what what ultimately get picks up people's interests. So that's that's really, you know, what what ended up being the, the glue between what we were doing in the product environment and the rest of the business and the decisions that were made was being able to, to show the commercial impact um, quite clearly of what we were doing. Um, and, um, you know, as you'll know yourself, there is no, no perfect way of being able to show the revenue or commercial impact of an experimentation program but you have to do it. You have to try if you're gonna if you're gonna get traction. So that's what we were what we what we did, and we you know we were able to go around and say we you know we have been able to both generate and save this amount of money through these initiatives that we've been doing, and you know and, and that's what gets people interested and what gets people understanding how they can make decisions around things. Were there any other communication strategies or forums or or other types of uh, modes that you use that you found really effective and you would advise other teams or people use? Um, I think like, uh, other than that, I mean, you know, communicating and socializing experiments and if possible, those being the most contentious experiments that you can, that you can use as examples, that's always a good one is, you know, like things that are a bit divisive in terms of what, people think of in terms of you know the control versus the variant are always good because you you know the the answer is not you know somebody might not be happy with the answer but it's not your fault it's the data you know that's, mm. that's what customers are doing so that, that is really really powerful i think the other one is just to try and instill in you know in everybody a, a sense of of saying 
oh, you should, you know, you, you well, just like Chris Gowan's book, you should test that. You know, I've, I've read that years and years ago and it sort of stuck with me that that is really what you're trying to instill is to get people to think, yeah, that's a good idea. You should test that. And, but in, in that statement, we didn't really go into it in that book that I remember, but within that statement is loaded the fact that actually all ideas are, are completely welcome. And, and that's really important. Like, I think if you, you, what you don't want is people to think that actually the process and the ownership of idea generation is, is somebody's responsibility and they're going to use data and research and everybody else's ideas are worthless. It's, you know, all ideas, no matter how stupid they seem, are completely and utterly valid, providing you test them. So, you know, that, that's really what, what you try and get across is that is, I guess, ultimately what I'm saying is, uh, is to invite ideas from everybody. Um, and that is a communication in itself. You know, if you can, if you can really firmly communicate that all ideas are welcome and give people the way in the forum to submit ideas, um, then they become involved in the process. They become involved in the program because everybody loves to see, you know, what happened to their idea and what the outcome of it was. Um, so yeah, I think that's the other, the other really important thing. You touched a little while ago on organizational politics. What were some of the stakeholder management and politics that you had to clear a path for the program to succeed? Yeah, but I mean, business politics is, uh, is, an, is a funny kind of thing. And, you know, I, I, my answer will not be specific to Sky. It's, uh, you know, I've, I've worked at, in and with a, a lot of big corporations. And, you know, really, it ultimately comes down to survival, I guess, really. Like, you know, big, big companies, they restructure, you know, constantly. Some, you know, a, a lot more frequently than others. And so everything's moving and changing. And, and you know, ultimately, like, at a very senior level, people are both protecting and making a claim for resource and funding from you know, pots of funding. And so, you know, like as, as a senior person in a business like that, you are constantly kind of under fire from other people going, well, I don't think that's really worth us doing. I think we should do this and stuff like that. So, um, so, you know, senior people are really kind of trying to make a claim for things and trying to justify their existence. And, experimentation is actually a really good way to support that. Like, you know, if you understand what, it, what people are trying to achieve, you know, um, because it, it, it allows somebody to prove or disprove something that they want, it, you know, at the end of the day, like these things always end up in a bit, uh, in a bit sort of complex kind of spin type discussions. Cause obviously somebody wants to, they want an outcome and that is, you know, that's happening. It's like <laughs> they, they don't really have the option. You don't really have the, the, the option of, you know, being sort of open to one outcome or another. But even so, you know, like um, what, what, I, what I've always tried to get across is that just being wedded to the process of experimentation is, an, is in and of itself really positive. Like, you know, as a very senior person, if you can say, we are using a rational process to further the commercial interests of this area of the business. And, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to sort of turn away from bias and things like that, that are not, not going to deliver. Then that in itself can be a very strong position politically. Um, so yeah, that's the short answer. I mean, you know, business politics is a, is a super complex and pretty boring area really. Um, and there's not a lot you can do about it. Like, it's just like, like going back to what I was saying at the beginning around that, that's how the nature of hierarchical businesses work. Um, yeah. And there, there's some interesting theories about ways that you would actually make business non-hierarchical, which I won't go into, but, um, yes, yeah, so an, an interesting thing that I got, that I got quite, um, uh, into reading about a couple of years ago. So, yeah, but we're, we're, we're a long way off general business being like that. Completely. So what were some of the major benefits that you saw 
from the program, you've touched on commercial benefits, which was um, you know an excellent way to frame the the efficacy of the program. What were some of the other benefits you observed within the business? I think um, I think you know one one of the things that um, that I was always quite proud of was just being able to shift the culture of product development towards being more open to the idea of experimentation um that, that's another thing that was just really interesting and again it's not it's not really a sky thing it goes way beyond sky is that um, when you've got product teams working agile or you know allegedly agile um there's a there's a particular kind of culture that goes with that which tends to come from the fact that most people working in that environment I either either at that point or back or in the in their career up until that point have been very much just focused on delivery so you know the the the, the, the actual concept of agile is meant to be that you've got a fairly autonomous unit of engineers responding directly to customer needs and customer behavior and customer requirements and iteratively developing a product um via data on what customers actual customers are, are being are feeding back and, and how they're using the product that's what agile is supposed to be to me in a kind of a utopian sense but it never really is that what it is is um uh you know being faster at delivering what other people ask um and so a lot of people in in that world are very much focused on just delivering so it's like you know we've got this list of stuff to do that's been given to us by somebody else um and we're just going to do it and we're gonna, you know we've got to get through it as fast as possible that's that you know that's the delivery mindset and what you want to do is is start to build in you know some questioning and challenging to that should you actually do that um actually that's a good idea but we think we could do it in a slightly different way um and to, and to try and put experimentation at the heart of that um you know is really the is really the goal and i won't pretend i won't pretend like you know we we've completely changed the culture of product development at sky like that um but we did get some way so um you know that that was that was a, an interesting and and good outcome for me that we you know that there were places where we started to really you know show that product development and and that sort of engineering mindset was happening in a slightly more, um, you know, a, a, a better way. Mm -hmm. Adding the the validation step into the product development life cycle rather than skipping straight from idea to to build. Yeah, exactly. So, if you had your time again, what's one thing that you would potentially look to do differently? Um, I guess so. Well, I mean, in general, along the way, I learned a huge amount that, you know, in a if, if you could magically go back and just know that right from the beginning, um, would have done things quite differently. Um, I think, I think actually now, right, right now, um, having been in an agency environment, um, I mean, I've worked in agency environments before, but, you know, in, it, 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 but quite a long time ago and right now working with businesses and and needing to sell to them and you know and you need, you kind of need to constantly sell and resell the idea of what you're doing and and show the benefit there's a lot that i've learned now that you know in terms of almost like the selling side of it that had i had that experience joining sky i think i probably would have been able to do a lot more convincing of wider areas of the business um so yeah well whilst that is what i did like you know i think like thinking back there are way there are techniques and ways of communicating things and ways of explaining things that i have now that had i had then would have would have been able to you know provide people a simpler vision yeah no i, I completely agree that's uh something that uh implementing and establishing an experimentation program that I've grappled with as well, that, that there's the, the, the doing of the experimentation and the generating of the results, but it's really what you do with the results 
And it seems like, you know, the magic really happens in how you communicate those results. And uh, yeah, it's about really simplifying those results and outcomes, what they mean for the relevant business departments and putting it in very meaningful terms that people can understand, rally around and really get behind that, that mission. Yeah, I think the other thing is that different people that you talk to um, have very, very, very different perceptions of what experimentation is um, before you even start saying anything to them. And, um, you know, some, some people have almost no knowledge of it, but other people have, have a very different perception of what it is. And you have to be able to tailor what you say according to that sort of background experience because, uh, you know, th- th- there's one way that you could explain what you're doing, which for some people would seem incredibly complicated and for others would not. And so you almost have to say, you almost have to tailor exactly what you're saying in quite a dramatic way for different people based on their past experience and their perception of what it is. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, understanding who you're talking to and, and, and understanding a lot about questioning them a lot first around their, what they think it is and what they think the outcome of it is first mm-hmm. allows, you to, allows you to talk to them in a very different way. Good point. So businesses that are looking to commence an experimentation journey, what would your key pieces of advice be for those that are just getting started with experimentation? Yeah, I think number one would be don't underestimate the skill involved. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a real problem, I think, that like, you know, I see it all the time that it is ostensibly very easy to run a b tests so like you know if, you, if you're going to get into a b testing on your website you can get google optimized you can stuff that uh, you know in google tag manager and you can run an a b test that's that's sort of really easy and but that does not constitute experimentation it doesn't constitute anywhere near you know running a good experimentation program so however you go about it, you need to make sure you are sourcing skill and, and experience in, in running experimentation. Because whilst it's very easy to do, it's very, very, very easy to do it wrong. Um, and to, to the extent that you, there's no, you might as well not bother, right? So like uh, you've got, I mean, we, I've come across businesses where they sort of say they're already doing experimentation and they're, like literally what they're doing is running tests for like an hour and then stopping it and going, no, that's the winner, you know? <laughs> um, and I mean, you know, that's no joke that, that, that sort of stuff happens all the time. Um, because it just seems, it seems like such an easy thing to do. It seems, you know, and somebody in a marketing team going, yeah, I've, I've done that. I'll run a couple of experiments is, is just a million, million miles off actually doing it properly and generating value from it. And there's so much that goes into doing it, doing it properly. And, you know, I'm not saying you have to go and let, invest like absolutely hundreds of thousands of dollars or pounds or whatever, you know, but, but just whatever, whatever way you're doing, you have to be sure that you're getting it right and you've got the right skills, especially around statistics and things like that, but also just about, how you learn from the tests and how where you come with ideas and all this sort of stuff. It's a, you know, it's not, it's not an easy thing to do. That would be my main one. Um, yeah, the way I think about that, uh, poorly designed experiments produce poor data and insights, which leads to poor decisions, and then which leads to poor business investments, which impacts uh, business strategy. So it's like a, a flow on effect that really stems end to end if uh, yeah. experiment is not a, a a trustworthy rigorous and disciplined process exactly and it's like i say you're better off not bothering because if you if you if you think you're running a testing program and you're making decisions about what to do and and the vast majority of those tests are false positives which is entirely is entirely feasible if you're not um running the stats properly then you would be better off just guessing like you'd probably actually be better off guessing because you, you know, you, 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 there would be a bit more thought around it other than 
what's effectively like flipping a dice uh, or flipping a coin right. five times or something. So, um, yeah, it's you know it's, it's it's easy to get wrong. Okay, just closing with three quick questions now. So, signature question: an experiment that you've performed that reframed organizational perspective. Yeah. Uh, so it, interestingly, like this, this, a series of experiments rather than one experiment that we're running for a client right now. Um, so I have, I have a, a client uh, who is, sells furniture. They're an, e- a, an e-commerce retailer of furniture. And they have two different types of, or two different sort of sets of products. One, they buy in products and, ha- and warehouse them themselves. And then you're buying that direct from them. Or they're kind of almost drop shipping. So when you order, it's it's ordered on demand from a manufacturer who actually builds it and sends it. And the first types of products you you can get within two days. The second type of products it will take maybe sixteen weeks to get. And so we've we've done a huge amount of uh, initially just sort of some small testing on trying to kind of limit people's um, choices, trying to limit what they see to just stuff that's in stock. To say does does showing them just express delivery products increase conversion which it hugely did um and uh, so we sort of built up that to bigger and sort of more bolder tests and things like that this where this is eventually going which is is for me a really interesting aspect of how experimentation works is a big strategic question which is should they even sell the products that are um that they don't stock uh, another potential option would be to actually split the brand so you've got two different brands. One, the way you can focus on the express delivery aspect of it, and another way you can focus it on the quality. Um, so those are really – we haven't answered the question yet, but those are, those are big sort of strategic questions. And that is a really good example that I often give people as to how experimentation should work. It's bottom-up strategy development. You're learning something from running small tests that then – creates a really big question that you need to answer in a big way of running a business differently. And that, that is way better than, you know, that's way more important than, you know, going after winning tests to hack a bit of money out of the website. You know, if you want, if you really want to get the value out of experimentation, that's how you do it is you, you learn and you pivot your business on the back of what you learn. Yeah. I think that's a really good example because it really highlights how strongly experimentation should be anchored back into strategy and in this particular example that you've provided, that it, it raises uh, a big question around uh, strategy and is a, a strategic pivot required? Exactly. And once you've, once you've realized that that's a question that you need to kind of existentially solve, then you can start designing a load of other experiments to, it, to support it even further and to gather the data that you need in order to make the decision. Hmm. Question number two. Your top three resources that you would recommend to the audience, uh, as in tools and books, blog. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, so, I, at the moment, I'm a really big fan of reading books that are not directly about experimentation, things like that, because like, I think you can learn a lot about um, about you know, stuff from outside of the direct industry and things like that. So um, I think some some interesting stuff that I've read recently, um, how, how to Think Like a Rocket Scientist was quite a good book, I think. Um, I'm going to struggle to remember the names of stuff, um, I think. Um Oh yeah, um, another another book which is um, oh, about uh, about continuous improvement. So continuous improvement is sort of a an extension of the kind of kaizen, you know, manufacturing thing. Like, so if, I can't actually exactly remember the name of the book. I think it's called How to Win with Continuous Improvement. That's right. So that was quite interesting. Um, and. And and the other area generally, I would say that I've been kind of focusing on. It actually, j- just like I mentioned before, some interesting things about organisational hierarchy. So um, there is uh, there is a movement called um, uh, holoc- holocracy, holacracy, 
which is a is a is a system of non hierarchical business management and because of the stuff that I was talking about, I got quite interested in that. And there's a few other things like that in that area. Um, to just think about how you might how you might run a business non hierarchically, and thinking how that might how that might impact the ability to do experimentation. So yeah, that's that's a, a few sort of themes that I've been looking into around um, reading and learning. Final question: If people want to get in touch with you, what's the best place to find you? LinkedIn. So yeah, con- connect with me on LinkedIn. I, I, I'll, 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 you know, connect with anybody on LinkedIn. I, I'm very, very open to um, having conversations with anybody about anything. Really, like uh, I'll, I'll always try and make time for that. So uh, anybody wants to talk about anything, um, I am very, very happy to do that. Fantastic. Thanks so much for your time today, Johnny. Great to chat. Thank you very much. That's all from this episode of Experimentation Masters. Just one more thing before we say goodbye. We can use your help to keep improving the show. If you have any feedback or suggestions for future episodes, you can email at gavin at firstprinciples.ventures. Visit firstprinciples.ventures for show notes, resources, and information. If you enjoyed this show, give us a share on social media. Make sure that you subscribe so that you don't miss an episode. Experimentation Masters. Lead with more confidence.